all right so good morning good afternoon good evening from wherever you are joining um, the time is up and so I think we are good to start um, so I'd like to officially welcome all of you it's been good to have you so today is the first day of the four day um, sort of webinar series which would be focusing more on how to hand I mean the the right ways of using NetSeed DF data in Python using the Python programming language or the scientific tool Python and then its accompanying packages to work effectively with NetSeed DF data set and so there's supposed to be a one hour session so what we would want to do is I would go through the tutorial material and then you can also try your hands alongside and I'm anticipating that in about 45 minutes that should be done and then we make room for questions you know I mean more oral questions after that but then while I'm going on if there's anything you want me to throw more light on the chats are enabled you can type your question in the chat and I would be able to respond to that while I'm just going on with the um, the whole seminar series then after the 45 minutes there'll be some 15 minutes for you know extra questions all right so officially you're welcome thank you and so to kick start um this is just a brief bio of myself so this is organized by meteor data in conjunction with pi 4 ca and there's a joint webinar series and you have my details over there, my Google Scholar link, ResearchGate, ORCID, and then other social handles. And then also, if you want to get, in, I mean, get in touch with me beyond this training, you can reach me via any of these mails. That's the institutional mail or the Meteor Data mail. And today's training is accessible via github so when you go into my github repo i'm going to share that link with you briefly so that um, it's easy to follow on with what i'll be doing yes so uh Chinme, of course um, currently it's also being streamed on the meteor data youtube page so if you go there you would also find it and it's also being recorded and so beyond this um, it will be shared Okay, so that's the URL to the GitHub repo, and then once you are on there, I could just run you through what to do. All right, so to be able to run the Python packages or the whole Python programming language, you need the environment. In fact, uh, the most recommended, what I would recommend is to just go onto your Google um, search engine and then type, just type in Anaconda Navigator or just Anaconda. And so if you just go into your um, Google search engine, just type in Anaconda and then you can get a download for whatever version or whatever OS you are using. You just go into the Anaconda distribution, download it and then this gives you access to a whole lot of you know, Python interpretable um, platforms like the Jupyter, the Spider, VS Code, PyCharm and the rest. Okay. and since we um, I mean it wasn't communicated earlier which particular um, interface or framework we'll be using whether um, Jupyter or Spider or whatever one we'll be using what we've done in here is that when you go onto the github repo there's a binder that has been linked to this github repo so if you click on this binder logo what it will do is it would open up the whole github interface for you it open that up in a new place and then what it does is it also binds up everything that we have in here and sort of hooks it onto um, a sort of a remote server somewhere and then allows you to work directly so if you um, maybe for time sake wouldn't be able to download all these ones you can just click on the launch binder and then that should load all the necessary packages and when it's done I'll show you how it looks and 
you can follow through whatever we are doing from the binder and it would work perfectly well if you already have anaconda you can equally you know get pull it from github and then um, run that also on your local server i mean your local system all right okay so once we have that out of the way i'll be currently running this for my local system and once you have the binder you can also follow um, suit okay All right, so this is supposed to be a four four day series, sort of four separate Monday series. So in today's um, first episode, what we'll be tackling at uh, are just the basic terminologies. I mean, how to you know handle the netcdf data um, file using XRA. In fact, you can also use netcdf4 and then other you know packages, but then. For this training, we'll be focusing more on the XRE. So we'll look at how to simply open and close your NetCDF file. I mean, what data sets are, what data arrays are, are they the same? Do they vary? What makes the difference? I mean, how to find the attributes of your data, how to select certain variables from your data, I mean, your file, and then how to slice along particular dimensions. And then we'll wrap it all up with some basic data visualizations across, you know, individual or specific dimensions and then hopefully if this takes us a 45 minutes then we would have some question time which would address all your concerns so to kick that when we talk of a net cdf file this is typically representing a network common data form file system and so this is just multi-dimensional data and it's very useful in our field of science especially where data seems to be growing now data capacities are growing and so it's best to keep them in very sizable forms or in more representable forms and so netcdf is one we have the hdf format there's a bufr format the .tif format there are a whole lot of data formats but then we'll be focusing more on the netcdf data files now these data files are structured in such a way that they might have spatial information time information and also some scientific values and so we can have data represented over the entire globe over varying time layers, over, I mean, specific variables. So I can have in one data set, individual parameters, say temperature varying over the entire globe, varying over pressure levels, varying over certain time steps. And then also have, say, um, cloud information, have rainfall information, other parameters, all stored in that same file. And so NetCDF is typically just self-describing. Now it has not just the data, but it also has information that describes what the data contains. And so when you, when you take a NetCDF file, it has headers or sort of links that direct you to the information. So um, we'll be talking about the various ways within which you can visualize this data set and then how to get the information. Now NetCDF is also portable, it's scalable, it's appendable, you can add on to it and it's also shareable of course you can share it in its format you can archive the data i mean equally compress and so on and so forth all right now previously we had um say the nc dump nc view approach and if you're on windows you also had what we call the panoply or panoply depending on how you'd call it and so with that you can visualize the net cdf data set so with nc dump for instance you can just hit your nc dump space minus h and then it gives you the headers it gives you the whole description of the data set similarly with panoply you can just load your data it's more like it has a graphical user interface you load your data you see the attributes and then you can then you know try to have some visualizations based on the data but then what we want to do now is we want to integrate this directly into Python because, of course, Python is very easy to use, it's user-friendly, it has a wider community. And so we want to integrate that in. All right, so like I was explaining, when you pick something like this, think of it as data that has different dimensions. See, the X being our longitude, Y being latitude, the vertical being, let's say, in this case, our time steps. All right, so this is like a 2D layer that is varying over certain times. So think of it as land, you can think of say land use data or land, um, yes, think of land use data that is varying over 
particular days, for instance, that are compressed together. Or think of it as images that we've taken at different time steps. So we'll capture a particular space over certain time steps and then lay, layering in, I mean, sort of layering all of them over the other. Okay, so with that, you can pass that into a NetCDF format. And of course, we can get the data attributes or data information for particular positions, particular dimensions, and then so on. All right, so in Python, our uh, focus will be on the XRE. We can use XRE, we can use NetCDF4. But then, like I said, our focus will be on the XRE, trying to read this. There are some basic things we need to understand. I mean, data sets, data array, what are variables, what are coordinates, what are dimensions, and so on and so forth. I'll come to it again. Um, if you need further detail, you can visit the XRE page and then have uh, a lot of you know detail on that. All right. Now, for this training, I'll be using um, data sets from a remote, and that's from my Google Drive. Now, this link is shareable, so I mean, the procedure we are going to use, wherever you are, you can access that data as a try. If you don't already have your net CDF data, you can try using the same data, and then it should work. All right, and so in order to access the remote data from Google Drive, we'll have to make use of the package called GDown, which is for, I mean, a Google Drive download. So what I'm doing in here is, let me explain this in bits. So in Python, you have the try exception. So I'm assuming that we have some basic knowledge of Python here. So try is just um, telling the language, or I mean, your, your program to um, attempt running this line of code. But then if you have an error, then move on to the exception and then perform whatever is contained in the exception. You can have you know, multi layers of exceptions and um, run them through. So in this case, we are telling this to import just a G down. So why import G down? Now in Python, the packages we make use of, we have to import them. Now you can access all these packages from the PyPy page that's if you go on to pypi.org you should have a host of all the packages there. So if you search for them, whatever package you need, you can just search for it here and you would find it with some, you know, description, how to um, download it. For instance, if I click on this G down, it will give me the procedure. So pip install G down. Okay, so if you don't already have this package, then it means you would have to pip install. Now I'm working with a Jupyter interface. so. In order to install, then it means I'll just have to, let me wipe this first, type in pip install g down. Okay. And then, you know, proceed this with an exclamation to allow this run as though you are running on the command prompt or your terminal or console. Yeah. Now, so what we did in here is that we assume that the g down is already installed. So if that is already installed, then we try to import it. Now, if it's not installed, import g down will produce an error. So if there's an error, then it means we now skip the try into the exception where we now tend to download the g down before we re sort of import the g down. Okay, so this is just to check if the g down package is accessible, if it's available. If it's not, then we install that. We download it from the PyPy page, install it on our local um, system or our local PC, and then import the g down again. All right. Now, this is just the URL for the, the shareable, I mean, file on the Google Drive. So, there's the URL. Now, what happens is, let me explain this from here. So, uh, well, I don't know if this is really <laughs> necessary, but let me still explain it. So, for instance, if I pick this up, this is my string, and then I split them along the you know, slashes. So if you look through these, there are different slashes. Now there's a string. So this whole thing is contained in a single code. So it's a string. If I split that along the slashes, it splits them into individual, you know, um, elements of a list. And so wherever there is a slash, the portions before it will be one element. The ones between any two consecutive slashes will be another element. And so the file ID which we need is mostly what comes after the D all the way to the slash before the view. So once I need that, if I slash these ones out, the position on negative two would be this. 
which is the file ID. Okay, so now what we are doing in here is when I have, think of it this way, if I have a whole list of items, say A, B, C, and let me call this say my list, and I want to access the, let me add more. If I want to access the element D, now we know Python indexing starts from zero. The indexing is just a position. So A is on position zero, B position one, C two, D three, and then E four. Even though we have five elements, their positions are from zero to four. Now the same way, if we go in the reverse order, this E becomes negative one. So this was our zero. Now when we are going back, the E becomes negative one, D becomes negative two. So if I pick my list, and then I tell it to produce the elements at position negative two. It produces just the D. All right, so if you look into what we've done, we pick this whole list, split it, and then we, our uh, file ID is the negative two element. So if I just add my position negative two here, it picks just the file ID. All right, so with that file ID, we are now going to add it to this prefix. So we have our prefix, uh, I mean the prefix of HTTPS, drive.google.com, UC, ID, and then we add the ID to it, and that will be our download ID. Okay, now when we are done, um, all we need to do is just use gdown to download the download ID. Okay, so just this would have been enough. Okay, but then if I keep downloading this file throughout, let's say, anytime I run the script, whether it is there or not, it's going back to download. Alright, so even though this is the file ID, in the end, the file we are having is just this, africa underscore crew underscore data dot nc. So what we are doing is we are trying to use the file name that would be produced, I mean the file that will be downloaded. So we just import OS from Python and then use the os.path.exist to check if this file already exists locally on our PC. If it does, then it means there's no need to download, so we just pass. If it's not, then we can now download the particular um data and then we have it currently i have this already so if i should still run this it wouldn't um do anything because the data I already have but if you run this you would notice that your data starts downloading all right okay and then the very first part is just on the retrieval of the data and this is purely because you are using a google drive data it's not always going to be the case if you already have your data then you skip that part then what we come on to is to just import the XRA. So we are making use of the XRA package. So we import XRA as XRA, which is an alias. So XR becomes the shorter way we can call XRA and then all the accompanying packages or sub packages. So whenever we import this, it means if I want to make use of a sub element of XRA, it means I type in, for instance, XR dot, and then I tap all the sub packages would uh, would show okay so all these are sub packages and if I want to make use of them I would have to call them as part of XR so XR dot the child package or dot the sub package all right okay so all right and then what we also did next was that we just has in this um, filter warnings we imported filter warnings from warnings now this is not necessarily trying to you know deal with errors what is going to deal with is just a warning so there are some codes that you run which are not necessarily producing errors but they are just producing warnings telling you that a certain line of the code or some functionalities will be obsolete soon and so I mean um, you wouldn't want your page to be flooded so you just import the filter warnings and then just ignore all the warnings in this case um, and then we are done. So now we already have our data set downloaded. The data file is called Africa underscore crew underscore data dot nc. We can just read the data set by typing in xr, which is our xre dot open data set. So if you have your xr, so if you have your xr dot open data set. We pass in the name of the file, so um, which is the Africa um, crew data dot nc. 
all right so there's one way to do that and then assign it to a variable and so that variable will now contain all the contents of that file okay so and that's what we've just done on the next step by defining the file name as you know a variable file and then passing that variable into the open data set and reading that into ds so now if we run this we should have ds containing our data so if i type here my ds and then i mean control enter or shift enter it gives me the contents of that particular file okay and i'll come down to this again we'll look at this in some detail soon so i'm going to close this one first now if i need to close the data set just the i mean variable name the ds dot close and then it closes the data set all right so that's just the first part how to open and then close your netcdf files now the next part is to you know identify or to look at how to um, select the individual variables within the data so if you look at your um, so this time let me open ds underscore data because that's the variable name i used here so if you look at this this tells us that this is a data set read by xrs so this is a form of xre data set it has these dimensions that the longitude latitude and then the time that's 150 longitude points 146 latitude point and then 1440 time steps and then it also has coordinates now i'll also talk about this again in detail or let me just do that so there's a difference between the dimensions and then the coordinates so dimensions are just think of dimensions as placeholders all right and then think of the coordinates as the actual magnitudes or the values the, as the actual values or the actual magnitudes within the um, placeholders okay so think of um, probably back in the basic school the primary school i mean all the um, sort of number lines you did all right so you are given a point say okay a has the values two three okay the dimensions in that case are just two telling you that these are x and y dimensions that's just two but then the actual coordinates are the two and three that means two on the x three on the y okay and that's the difference between the dimensions and the, co the coordinates so the dimensions are just the blank placeholders or telling us how far off into a particular space or a particular region we can go and then the coordinates are the quantum or the actual values contained along those individual dimensions so if you look at the longitudes here we have values for them this tells you the longitudes contain you know positions of say negative 19.75 so there's longitude negative 19.75 negative 19.25 of course we know the negatives are the west the positives are the eastern ends and you can clearly see that there's a difference between the dimension the dimension tells only the total number of elements we have along that dimension but then the coordinates gives you the detail all right and then we have the variables so the variables we have a whole lot of them there's a dot pre for instance for precipitation which is what we are using as a sample there's the stn for the station numbers so looking at the number of stations that were included in a particular grid for the data interpolation of course crew is a gauge sort of interpolated data and then we have the indexes tell, telling you i mean the various sort of indexing for every dimension and then some extra attributes and we'll look at this again into detail there's just more like the headers and then the information that um, is assigned to the net cdf file all right so now our focus is on how to call the variables so to call out a variable from a data set we have two approaches one is to use just a dot method to so have our ds data which is the data set and then the variable in this case we are calling is the pre so ds dot pre will call the presentation data from the ds data set and then you notice that when we try ds data it was a data set and then all the variables were listed now when we go down and then we call the pre from the ds data this changes to a data array telling us this an individual element within the data set okay so all the individual variables can be um, sort of individual data arrays and so data sets are a collection of data arrays all right 
and so you can see again we have the dimensions the coordinates and then the attributes so there's one approach that's option one using the dots method so the data set dot just the name of the variable now the second option is to use the square brackets approach so we have the name of the data set we bring or we introduce our, our square brackets and then pass a variable as a string that means containing single or double quotes so the pre you notice when we did the dot pre there was no single quotes no let's say double quotes but then in the square brackets method we call the PRE in single or double quotes and then the output is the same it gives us the same um, data array all right and so some more detail on what data arrays and data sets are which i've already explained so a data array is just a multi-dimensional array labeled and then has some name dimensions and the rest now the data set is more like a combination of data arrays so it is a dix like that's a dictionary like collection of data array objects so if you take our data set it has all the individual you know data arrays contained as variables in them and that's the difference between the data sets and data arrays all right now we could equally also check the type by you know in python if i just run the type typ and there's a method or a function so i have my open and close brackets and let me just pass in the value one just look for the type of one it tells us there's an integer if i pass this one in single quotes it tells me there's a string if i have say um the type of 1.2 there's a float and so we can check for a whole lot of data types using this approach so what we've done in here is to look for the data type for the ds data and this tells us that this is a data set found or sort of produced generated from the x array um, approach so we use the x array to call out this data set and then we check for the individual variable which is the pre and then we have this being a data array also of course from the x array and then we can see clearly that there's a difference between these two all right so now to check the data variables we just have ds underscore data which is the name of the data set we had and then dot data underscore vars that's the data underscore variables and this gives us the variables contained now you notice that unlike the data set which produces all the items this one only focuses on the variables and tells us this data set contains these variables and these are their dimensions and other attributes we can of course also check the shape of a particular data array element so we have the ds data dot pre which is a data array and then we check the shape of that and then we can also check the size using the you know dot size and it should work now if we want the coordinates we just pick our data set or data array and then dot quotes that's to produce the coordinates it tells us this contains longitude latitude time of these elements then if we want the dimensions we just call ds underscore data dot dims to give us the dimensions telling us there's a longitude i mean 150 elements longitude 146 elements latitude 1440 elements time step and then if we want Yeah, so um, similarly, you can get the coordinates by just calling the data set, in this case, ds underscore data, and then dot quotes, and that produces the coordinates. And so we have the coordinates, longitude, latitude, time, with the uh, respective values, um, indicating you know the specific values along each dimension. Now, to get the dimensions, we just call the data set dot dims, and it gives us the dimensions as a dictionary, which is a fruit, uh, I mean, a frozen set. And in this case, telling us that we have the longitude of 150 points, 146 latitude points, and then 1,440 time steps, or I mean, individual time points. Now, to get the attributes, we call data set dot attrs, which is the attribute, and then we have all these attributes of course we can call any of them now there's a dictionary and so just like the normal um, dictionary you have the um, word and then probably what it means or what it's linked to and so we have the um, id and then what it's linked to so if i call for instance this ds data attributes i can just pull out the title and get just the title and get just the title from the header 
we can do the same thing on the data array. So let's say ds underscore data dot pre attributes gives us the attributes of the data array. And then of course we can run just say call just a unit. It gives us the units in millimeters per month. We can call the long name and also the correlation decay distance, which gives us the um there's a some sort of um, attributes that is linked with the crew, you know, interpolation method. Okay, so now the next step is to see how to select all subset data. So in order to select there, um, we are going to assign the data array of presentation to the variable DA for simplicity's sake. So we run this and assign as data to PRE to DA. So now when we pick our DA, we have just the precipitation data array. And now when you look here, there's typically just one data array. All right, now it's possible to select elements along any one or combination of dimensions. Now it's possible just say just to have DS, sorry, DA dot select, or uh, that's the dot cell, and then we specify. This case sensitive, so for instance, long, and then we equate it to a particular longitude value, let's say negative 19, a particular longitude value, let's say negative 19.75, and it selects just for that longitude, okay, conserving all the other dimensions. Now we can also select for a point, a point of course has a position on the longitude and latitude, so we have for instance negative 3.1 and negative 12. Now looking at the intervals within our data array we notice that of course we can't get the 3.1 because this is 0 0.5 spacing and so we have only 0.25 and 0.75s so what we can do is if i just use this method just um, select the longitude and latitude what it does is it produces an error so because these um, values are not identifiable they are not found in the data array so that's why we have a key error. So what we can do is to employ a certain interpolation method. So we can use, for instance, the nearest neighbor. And what this will do is that it picks the closest point to the given point. So there's no negative 3.1, but the closest is negative 3.25. And then the closest negative 12 is negative 11.75. And so it just tracks just that point. And so we can use the nearest neighbor. We can also use the forward filling method or the backward filling method using the F, F fill or B fill. And that's it. We can also select over an area just by selecting, let's say we pick our data array dot cell, then we use the slice method, which is easier. We have a long equals to, and then we pass in here the slice, and then we give a slice range. Okay, so in this case, for instance, I'm slicing from a longitude of negative four to five, that's four west to five east. And then I'm slicing over the time, that's from January, 2019 to December 2020. And of course, you need to check the data type. So for instance, if I go into the DA, you notice that our time is date time. When we open it up, you can see this more like a string format. Okay, so that's why we're using the string approach in the slicing. And so with this, we can select an area of selection or a particular, you know, sort of special or more like 2D slice it okay and the slices over the longitude all right now in some cases you might have a global data set or any data set that would be ranging from either 0 to 360 for particular data types or in other cases they have them from negative 180 to 180 where the negative 180 or the negative portions are the western end and then the positives are the eastern end and so for such data sets, it's I mean for such data sets, it's possible to also do a conversion between these two. So if I'm converting to the zero to three sixty range, that's from the negative positive to the zero three sixty range, then all we do is we just pick the coordinates. Remember we said from the DS data, which is our data set dot court, the negative and positive one eighty, that's west and east components, and also vice versa. So so this is the approach that converts into the 0360 range. And then of course, once we have this, you can select a point and plot. I see that Africa is being split over the zero degree longitude. And that's 
classically how it looks now this is not a global data set so you have this whole wide area missing but if it's a global data set you'd have seen it well and so it's possible to also reconvert it back just by adding 180 when it's the 0 to 360 you add 180 find the modulus of 360 and then subtract 180 and then once you're done it brings it back to the actual way so this also works of course we can also perform group by and resampling so we can pick your data um, array add a dot group by and then group them over a certain time window for instance if you pick our DA look at the DA and then it has the time component and that's order so it's possible to pick just the time and then only subset the year component all right so what we can do is we can create categories of all these years and then perform a statistic on them and that's typically what the group by does so we use this and it groups them on the yearly categories and then finds the summation over each year and then we can select just a particular year now when you do that um, when we run this you notice that it changes from the time to year dimension so now if you want to select we would select with the time but rather select with the year and of course because the year is an integer we can select with that and we are good it's also possible to go by over the year and then find the mean which is just the yearly averages uh, we can do the same goodbye over the months which is going to be just January to December and then also over the seasons which by default is the DGF, MAM and so on and so forth. If you need to use the your own categories then it means this is where the resampling comes in. So resample, we can resample the time on various windows say one year, months, days, time of day and all of that and then perform the statistic on them. Now this doesn't change the time to year like the goodbye does this conserves the time dimension still says it as time but just assigns the data to either the end or the start of the year depending on how you characterize it all right so when you look at this when we go to our time step you see that it has the same time information but just all of them pass to the end of the year so that's first december for all of them all right and so it's possible to resample now if you want to also resample over the month it's possible to do that 3 ms which is the start of the month though and we have the quarter also the various quarters so there's we are telling the data to be resampled over three month intervals starting from january so and then from there we perform the mean when we do this what this does is that it does the same as a seasonal averaging but then it starts from the start month i gave for instance in this case january so we have the first time step which is representation of january february march all average together then april may you know average in the next one together and so on and so forth all right okay and so far we've been working with the data we've not done any visualization to see how it is but one thing we need to understand is xra default def default visualizations if the data is 1D, it produces a line plot. If it's 2D, it produces a spatial contour plot. If it's 3D or more, it produces a, a sort of histogram. And so if I select just a point, for instance, 512, using a method nearest, which I've already explained, and that is going to be just a time series, which is a one-dimensional data. When we plot this, we have just a line plot. And we can also, again, resample the data on a yearly basis or group it on a yearly basis find the yearly totals and then plot which is still a time series or 1d plot now if i select just a particular time it means we're selecting just one layer of time but variable long latitudes. Like this is going to be 2d All right so one time step variable latitude long so if we plot this we have our 2d plot and of course we can group this on the yearly basis find the yearly sums and then the climatology of all the years and plot that and we have also again a 2d plot of the climatology that's a yearly climatology now if we select just a range of time what we've done is we still have the time as a range the latitude also as a range longitude as a range so if we plot this this three dimensional once it's 3d or more it produces a histogram all right and that's just simply how it works so we have here some tasks which of course you can try your hands on and if 
you find it challenging in fact the solutions are there you can look at it later but we hope you give it a try yourself so what we are doing is just for the whole cool data set we split the cool data into four climate regimes that's from 1901 to 2020 so we split them into 30 30 year intervals and then we visualize the long-term climatology and annual totals and then the the long-term climatology of annual totals and then their standard deviations based on their climatic regimes and then we also create a long latitude by month homolar plot for each climatic regime and then also use the CR1 as a reference the climatic regime one as a reference and then you estimate the magnitude of change for each climatic regime so I'm going to run through this so that we see how the output looks uh, but you would still have to run it yourself and then be able to get it work it's very simple if you are stuck you can always refer to the material in the worst case you can always also reach back to us and then we would be more than willing to assist you okay and so that's task three and then the final one okay okay so we have our home molar generated and then we also have a magnitude of change as a relative differences get to see how they work all right okay so just as a quick recap we've looked through the basic technologies all through till um, we concluded with some basic visualization so we had to import the XRA open and close in the TDF file look through the data sets and data arrays the differences the data attributes the variable selection the slicing and selection of the data and then we ended with a basic visualization so I'll end here for further questions. Thank you.